It's a great honor and a privilege to be with you this day and to celebrate um, the anniversary of, your con of our congregation. Um, I keep kind of have to remind myself I'm a member here. Um, you just don't get to see me very much. So, you know, sometimes I just can't help myself. I see the world sort of in relationship to business. And that's because I was called into ministry 17 years ago from a business background. And I still am fascinated with business. And I pay close attention to the business news. And one of the reasons is I think that you can really get a sense of our culture and even the nature of who we are as human beings when you watch how we behave in the open marketplace. And whether it's a giant corporation or the hot dog vendor on the corner in a big city, there is an understanding of kind of how the world functions when you pay attention to the marketplace and those that participate in it. And I think sometimes business concepts have a bearing on our understanding of life and perhaps even our faith. And let me give you an example. In 1994, there was a business book that was published, and it was written by C.K. Prahalad and Gary Hamill, and their book was called Competing for the Future, and it introduced a concept that they called core competencies. They said that successful enterprises need core competencies, and they defined them as things that brought real benefit to their customers, they were difficult to imitate, they created lots of new things, they were very unique to this company, this group of people, and they were difficult to pin down because it was a combination of things, not just one thing. So when you look at enterprises that are successful, they have core competencies that they bring that others can't or won't. So for instance, Apple Computer is one of the largest companies in the world, and you might think, what is their core competency? And you might think it's technology and, and building computers. But there are lots of technology and computer companies. Their core competency is that they make technology easy to use with elegant design. Their products outsell everybody else because they're simple to use, and that's it. Customers love their products, and they are hard to imitate. And they use this skill in lots of things, from computers, to telephones, to watches. They're the ones who can consistently do it. And it's not just design, it's not just technology, or branding, or innovation. It's all of these things that come together. And FedEx isn't successful because they have airplanes and trucks. They just know how to move things fast. And Disney, they know how to tell a story whether it's a movie or a Broadway play or a roller coaster ride, they tell stories. And the people who work for them in these places, this is what unifies them. So now you're thinking, why are we getting a lecture on business? Because when I read that letter from 1 John, this is what popped into my head that this is the church's core competency. And it started right in the beginning of that writing. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. That we're willing to die for one another, is that the core competency? No, I think that's an expression of what is the core, but it isn't the core. The core competency of the church is love. It meets all the criteria. It has great benefits. It's clearly difficult to imitate. It can be leveraged through many things, and it uniquely identifies us. It's difficult to pin down because it's rather a combination of things coming together. That's what John is impressing upon the church in this writing and impressing upon us as well. It is the unconditional love that 
is God's grace that we, as the church, have come to understand through Jesus Christ, particularly through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. God's willingness to be emptied into the person of Jesus to demonstrate love and concern for all he encountered and his willingness to go to the cross for our sake, for the sake of love. And the depth of this gift is revealed in the gravity of the demand. The depth of this love for each and every one of God's children, for us. In business, when you identify a core competencies, it only matters if you do something with it. And I think that's what John is telling us as well, that God's love, this incredible gift that we've experienced through Jesus Christ, it only matters if it abides in us and is converted, converted into something that matters for the community and the whole world. So John poses the question, How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? We're getting hot now. (laughs) And those words, refuses to help, it's better translated this way. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet does not open their heart? And the quick answer is, it can't be. When God's love truly abides in us, it spills out, and we open our hearts for those in need. And he goes on to make it clear what what our core competency is when he says, Let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. It is not enough to talk about God's love. It is not enough to hear and speak of love. We must put it into action. This is the core competency of the church. It what uniquely sets us apart from the world around us. It is what unifies us. The experience of God's love that we first experienced from Jesus our Lord that abides in us. And it is a combination of this love and our willingness to put unconditional love into action. And you see it, when it's done well, the church is at its best. In the Lower Susquehanna Synod, our synod, your synod and my synod, our mission is that where the hungry are fed, we, this, this is where the hungry are fed, as we have been fed by Christ. And people around us hunger for so many things. I mean, food is one, and throughout our churches, we support food pantries, we plant gardens, we pack backpacks to feed school children on weekends. For 120 years, this congregation has gathered in this place, unified by the love of Christ and our willingness to put it into action. Witnessing to the love of Christ and the love for one another and for people in the community through things such as hunger ministries, tutoring school children, going into prisons, and a love for the people around the world when we reach out to troubled places in the world, such as Haiti or Guatemala or our partners in the mission of the church in Tanzania. These are ways to create new things from this core competency of love. And yet, as I read this text, I wonder, what more could we do personally and as a community, a church together? What more can I do? Is my life really a reflection of the love of Christ in all that I do? In this passage, there's a difficult spot in verse 20 when it says, whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. What happens when our hearts do not turn to love? When we find ourselves not opening our hearts, but closing them? 
When we let our passion for politics turn people that have different political opinions into the objects of ridicule rather than the objects of love. How do we love those who make choices to which we do not agree? How do we love those who come from different faith traditions? How do we love those who hate us because of our faith? How do we love people who use violence and terror against the weak? How do we love the unlovable? Our hearts condemn us, the text says, and then it says God is greater than our hearts. God knows everything. And we might hear this as God's condemnation for our struggle trying to love the unlovable, but I hear it as God's love is greater than our love, that God knows everything and God knows that we struggle, and God abides in us. And when we do not have the capacity, God fills us. And it's said in verse 24, he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. God's spirit is at work in us. God is working in us to give us a boldness to love. And in verse 21, it says, we have a boldness before God. And we have received from God whatever we ask. And it might sound like we have God's MasterCard because we get whatever we ask. But whatever we ask follows God's commandment to love. And that following this core competency that uniquely sets us apart from the world. So who is it that we could boldly bring love to? So beyond us personally as a church, as a church, we are celebrating 120 years of honoring the past and planning for the future. How do we build on this core competency that we have as a church? And who is it that we can boldly bring love to? As bishop, I'm in churches all over the synod, and I attend many anniversary celebrations. And often, they simply are celebrations of the past because there is no vision for the future. Many of our congregations are, in fact, in decline. And the world around us is changing. In the last 10 years, the membership in our synod churches has gone down 25% and attendance down 30%. Why? Why? Because in some places, we believe that simply doing the same thing over and over again will somehow get a different result. That's what Einstein called insanity. We as the church, unified in the love that we know from Christ, must plan for a changing world. Not just for the sake of the people who are here but for the sake of the people around us who do not know the love of Christ, and for our children, and for our grandchildren, and for my grandchildren, Charlie and Jack, whom I entrust into this community while I'm off serving the larger church, and for the people who have not yet been born does this generation have to make sacrifices for the future generations? I think this is what John was saying when he said, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and yet sees a brother or sister in need and does not open their heart? The world now more than ever, now more than ever needs the love of Christ the world needs us to boldly reveal the love of Christ, the very thing that is our core competency. It has great benefits for the world. It is clearly difficult to imitate. It can be leveraged through all of the activities that we do, and it uniquely identifies us. And it is difficult to pin down because it is a combination of things in our life together. It is 
what unifies us. And God, through the Apostle John, is saying to us, God's love abides in us, God's hope abides in us, and God is asking us to be bold. Amen.